good morning. Um, this uh, is the outcome not of anything terribly scholarly, I'm afraid. It's, um, you know when you get an idea that buzzes around in your head for a long time and you have to write it down so you can stop thinking about it? It was one of those things. So I wrote it down and then it turned into this uh, tag paper. It is uh, rather abstract and perhaps <laughs> highly theoretical in a sense, but I also believe that's what tag is fundamentally about. So um, I decided not to be ashamed of that. And I want to talk about not necessarily the way time is interpreted in the past or about the past or the way that time may have been apprehended by past peoples. I want to talk about the way that we as archaeological practitioners, largely as excavators is the position that I've come from, but it doesn't have to be that, um, apprehend time directly as we excavate and see it in the ground. So that's that's the, the bottom line here, okay? It's talking about the way we as excavators and archaeologists believe we can or cannot see or apprehend a time in the physical deposits or indeed objects, artifact assemblages that we study. So I began with my own assumption that perhaps on reflection was erroneous, you see, which is that time exists for us to study in the archaeological record as we dig it. It actually that is an assumption I think that is often made, is often unspoken. But how we actually encounter time, the passage of time, in a deposit or in a site is somewhat under-theorised, and thus I've added this disclaimer. Um, I, I don't like getting lost too much in, in philosophy. I've been accused of it in the past, so I try and avoid it. Um, so what I want to look at here is archaeological time. And I'm going to advance four propositions, which were the, the sort of things that I was thinking about and I wrote down, about the way that time is apprehended by an excavator or an interpreter looking at an object assemblage. So it's very much about the discipline of archaeology and what archaeological time is. So bear with me, in other words. So the first proposition is that we do not, in fact, see, measure or detect time in archaeological deposits. I must say, I'm very surprised I haven't seen this image used a lot more in tags so far. I'm sure some of you have, but it's just, I must I know it's you know, uh, somewhat passe, but I thought I'd have to do it. What I mean by this is that there is no spatial component for time in the ground, not really. There's a metaphorical one that we give it, which is stratigraphy or whatever. Um, and that's because as human beings, as a species, we're actually rather limited in that we can only see in three dimensions. We can't actually see the fourth. Um, so instead, we give time a vertical dimension on a site, and we usually make that a vertical dimension. Right? But it is us giving that physicality to time that actually doesn't exist. So what I wanted to do, having recognised that, was think about what we're actually looking at, what constitutes this time. So I've come up with two horrible, well not neologisms, but they might as well be, instance with a T, moments in time, and instances, with a C-E-S, which are moments in space. And my contention, therefore, is that instants, things that have happened, once they are visible to us archaeologically, so once they have been deposited or built or done or cut, they are static in time. They have ceased to move in time. So what I'm actually talking about, to make it slightly less abstract, are these lines we put on a section. We'll use this example first. This recut here, or the original cut, or indeed the line we've put on top of that deposit, that is an instant in time. They represent the termination of processes, right? This line here is the termination of that fill being formed. It is an instant in time. This cut, this line we have drawn, is the end product of that cut being done. It is a termination. It's an instant in time. After that and before it, it was not like that because things immediately start to fill up. So this line is an instant, right? But it has no duration at all. It is merely the termination of a process. So these instants in time, which we codify by drawing lines to represent them, 
or and I put this up because also we can draw metaphorical lines around assemblages and call them a thing as well. I'm not going to go into that too much detail because that is definitely under theorised at this point. But these lines, we draw them, thus they are interpretive and they are situated in the present. That's not, I think, particularly contentious to say. So if these are lines, these instants in time that are represented by them, they have in them... I was really struggling for pictures, so I've just <laughs> gone for stuff that's quite abstract. This is supposed to be the daylight ter terminator across the moon, thus a line. Um, so these lines, being as they are instants, they actually have no duration whatsoever. They are merely a line. Um, to sort of put this, I don't know if there's any fans of GIS out there or indeed vector graphics um, drawing. You can draw a line in GIS, a line feature, you can make a line shape file, and no matter how you zoom, far you zoom in, it never gets any thicker. Because lines have a length but no width. So these terminations, these boundaries, these instances have no duration, they have no width. So that's the metaphor if you like. They are merely beginnings and I would argue primarily endings of processes. And even highly precise, that is the correct use of the word, chronometric dating of any form does not date these instants because it is dating things from within the context below or the context above. So those instants, those lines we draw, are both arbitrary and do not exist in time. They have no duration and they do not exist in time. Yet they are still fundamental to what we do when we interpret, because we have to use these plans and sections all the time. Thus you can say that these instants, despite the fact that what we illustrate our work with, have absolutely no existence in time whatsoever. So where does duration the span of time actually exists then? Well, obviously it exists in the context itself. It exists in the thing between these two lines. And duration is the time it takes for that deposit to accumulate, that wall to be built, that cut to be dug. Um, and of course we can date these. We can't date them incredibly specifically. We can estimate a range of dates for these things. I don't want to get into radiocarbon um, dating or chronologies because I I'm by no means an expert. There are far more qualified people in this room than I. Um, but it, the fact remains that these durations, the time it takes for these contexts to be filled or dug or whatever, exist between these two boundaries, these eruptions that have no duration of their own. So in a sense, these things float semi-arbitrarily because the beginnings, their beginnings and ends aren't fixed. These boundaries of a context are arbitrary, they have no width, no duration. And you can sort of see this, if you like, metaphorically, I must say, when we use the sort of boundary start, boundary end probability curves on radiocarbon models. You know, it's like a sort of, I, the way I try to picture it in my head as a useful analogy is trying to nail down jelly. You can get the nail through it and it might hold it a little bit, but there's still some wobble in there. So, if you accept the foregoing, I moved on to what it might mean. And this was primarily that to excavate a site, to draw a site, let's say, or to analyse an assemblage, is not to, inter is not to encounter time at all. What we're encountering and codifying are these instants that we are semi-arbitrarily using to classify within time. And of course, the other thing that's worth pointing out is that these lines we draw, these instants in time, do not predetermine the length of the durations that they encompass. Because of course you can have a deposit that forms very slowly, or one that is dumped very quickly. So the archaeological records that we see in these section drawings or in these plans are of time, but do not actually represent its passage in anything other than a metaphorical sense. Which begs the question, what is interpretation then? If I'm arguing that half of what we've produced here, these lines, do not exist in time. Well, interpretation is all about selecting instants in time, or instances, um, and drawing a line around them metaphorically and saying, well, we'll use these then to interpret. So we select a series of instances, as I have done here, 
I've called them early Neolithic and later Neolithic in this particular, di particular diagram, I've grouped them together and said, these are the instances which I will use to interpret this period or this period. The ones that I'm covered in weren't datable. And we select these instances and we say, right, these instances are early and Neolithic. But of course they're not contemporary, but we assume contemporaneity for the sake of our argument. They can't be contemporary because instances have no existence in time. But they're useful to us, they're interpretive uh, tools. And I think this might be something that Saren will come on to talk about when she talks about the labels given to cultures. So we select these instances, we group them together, we call them early Neolithic or later Neolithic, or we might call them phases on a site, periods in a landscape, or styles in an assemblage. And I think perhaps, I don't want to be, uh, maybe it's not, but this might be slightly reminiscent of what Gavin Levy says about objects, the contemporaneity of objects or not. And I think you could probably expand that to talk about periods of phases and deposits as well. Also, it means that instants are an ontology for criticism because you can look at the instances I have selected and called early Neolithic, and you criticise me on that basis and say, well, I don't think they are early Neolithic. Or why did you draw the line there? Why did you choose those instances? Why didn't you choose different ones? So interpretations are only therefore relevant to the instance that I or you have selected for analysis or those instances that you believe might be related to my interpretation by analogy. For example, if, and I have uh, dug a Neolithic house, I've selected the post holes, those instants in time that represent the digging and placing of posts, and I've grouped them together and I've called them a house. That's the first place that I can be criticized. And secondly, I've called them a particular type of house because by analogy, I've looked at an instant of ethnographic field work done in Northern Canada and said this, is, this may be relevant. So I have adapted an instant from a different time and place. So basically you can criticise me based on the instance that I have chosen. It also becomes an important way to criticise interpretation when we think, all right, let's take the instant of that pit that I showed you the, the diagram of. And relate that perhaps to discussions of structured deposition, which I know are not terribly popular now, but they make a good foil or straw map for this argument, so bear with me. There was a, still is, um, a tendency to try and say why these deposits were structured the way they were. What did they mean? And this was kind of the Hoderian mission of uh, symbolic meaning, symbolic archaeology. But of course, if you follow these propositions, then actually, even if you could detect the meaning, the reason behind building a tomb like that, or digging a pit like that, or putting those particular grave goods in a burial, it's only relevant for that one instant. The meaning of it changes immediately afterwards. The next one, or the next one, or the next one. It's also a problematic means of criticising phenomenological, phenomenological approaches to landscape <laughs> in the sense that the instant in which you are experiencing it, experiencing it is both unrelated to the instance of those past peoples and also those in the past must have been disconnected from one another because these instances, as I said, have no duration. <clears throat> all right, Ben. So what does that all end up meaning? Well, if you have all of these instants that exist in the past, that those lines on the sections or the things we've grouped together on the plan, what's the point of all this? Well, I particularly like that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe that's what I'm feeling now, who knows. Um, well, what you've got then is you have a, what we can't do with instances, we can't specifically date them because they don't exist in time, what we can do is we can put them in order. Because we can do that, we've done that, we use it, you know, Stratigraphic matrices are put in instance in order. Now, if we can do that, and we can analyze what's happening in each individual instant in time or instance in space, analyze them, record them, and interpret them, what you then do is build an understanding of every particular instant, patterns within every instant, the grave goods from one particular period, the grave goods from the next and the next and the next, and you build that detailed understanding of individual instances 
towards a picture of the general, general interpretation. And this sort of ends with my constant bugbear, that the idea behind archaeological interpretation is to understand and explain long-term change in human societies. So the instant is the unit, the minimum unit of analysis that that can occur in, in my opinion. Thank you very much.